Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. This is Comprehensivist Wednesdays. This is our third year. We've been doing this for two and a half years. This was the brainchild of CJ Fernley. And this is the first year we're doing it without him. And we hope to do even better this time. Okay, we have learned something from him. You know, I think, I don't know who it was who said that. Uh, I think it was Leonardo da Vinci. He says, uh, I know it was not Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci said, um, you know, poor is a student who doesn't excel his master. Okay, I can't uh, hope to excel CJ on, on Bucky. It's impossible, but I'm going to try. Okay. Um, but the better one I've seen is that if you stand on the stand shoulders of giants, and this includes Bucky and CJ and anybody else, Newton or anybody else you want, you must see further. You know, you can't drape on their shoulders and look down on earth saying that that's all you look at their feet and say that's that's where you are no 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 you have to see further all right so that's that's what we're trying to do um so we have decided after you know i asked cj i asked many people who have read buckminster fuller i told them that look we want to take one work of uh, buckminster fuller um and really go through it um, you know, we'll go at chapter by chapter, we'll select a set of chapters each time and just do a thorough study of it because this is in conjunction with our series on Bucky inspired comprehensivity, which we most of them, most of the, the meetups from that series are going to be on Sundays at 9 p.m. Eastern time. And we have got an amazing lineup planned. We have done already two meetups. We did a bunch of introductory meetups in 2020. We started off with a bang with a meetup by Stroopy Paul on spherical thinking and a meetup by Tom Miller on natural modular, which were just incredible. And both of them are going to be back. Uh, I just love you know, what both of them have to offer. So both of them are going to be back. Uh, Stroopy is going to be back this Sunday, um, Jan 8th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and then Tom Miller will be back on Jan 15th at 12 p.m. Eastern time. He has just launched his website. It's called naturalmodular.com. Um, I'm going to put it in the chat again uh, for anybody who wants it. And he's going to walk us. There is just so much material there. So much, you know, beautiful illustrations. Of, of geometry and his insights, you know, Tom's insights on geometry based on uh, Bucky's geometry. Uh, and he's going to walk us through the entire website. Uh, he has got six portals, so we'll be going through all of that. But these are just the, the things that we had not planned before. Uh, but we have got an entire plan. We have got January, February, March calendar all planned. We've got a wide range of presenters and wide range of topics, starting with parallels between William Blake and Bucky. We've got uh, by uh, Daniel Ari Friedman. We've got Peter Meissen talking about synergy. We've got Kirby Urner talking about dimension in synergetics. And it goes on and on. Okay, it's just amazing set of, you know, my friend Rupali Sharma is going to be talking about the views in education of Bucky comparing it to Montessori. We're going to come at it uh, in multiple ways. You know, we're going to have, um, you know, uh, Richard talking about social tensegrity. And these are just few of the ones, okay? And there are a lot more. And I have not even begun to contact everybody yet because so many people have been reaching out to us. Um, so we're going to do 100 meetups on Bucky, but in order to make the most of it, you have to commune with Bucky's own thought. There is no other way of doing that. All these people have taken Bucky's thought inside in them and have expressed what they can do with it. And that is priceless. But you will be able to make most of this series if you start reading uh, you know, Bucky's own works and we're doing Critical Path together to inspire people, not just to read Critical Path, but to read more things. I strongly recommend Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. 
we did a series of meetups, which is already there in uh, in our Bucky playlist, Bucky inspired playlist uh, on our YouTube channel, 52 Living Ideas. You can look at those and it's a very short book, 40 page book. It's the best introduction I have seen to Bucky's thought by himself. So, so with that, let's talk about Critical Path. So today we're just going to talk about why you should read Critical Path. And I'm going to ask people who are familiar with the book to first talk about it. So I'm going to start with Richard and then Kirby, and then if Stroopy is willing to talk about it. Um, so the question is, why should you read Critical Path? You know, what, what, what did you get by reading Critical Path and why should somebody read it? You're welcome to expand the discussion to your encounter with Bucky and where Critical Path fits in that. So uh, Richard, Kirby, Stroopy, and anybody else who has read the book, go ahead and type yes if you have read the book uh, in the chat, and I will call upon you. So let's start with Richard. Richard. Hmm. Well, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> it's quite something to be able to, to, to start off. But I'm just going to walk back in my own history just a little bit. My background is uh, an academic uh, and a practitioner in the field of social work. And I was introduced to sy systems thinking in, this, in the 60s uh, in my graduate studies. And at that time, <clears throat> the argument was is that systems are a set of interacting parts. And so after I started to work with the concept of systems, which really seemed to fit well with my discipline, I started asking the question of how many parts does it take to make a system? And nobody would answer. Um, it was always, well, whatever number you want. Um, eventually it got down to minimum two. Uh, and, and it was about 10 years later that I was introduced to Fuller's ideas and his thinking, and in particular through a very surface sort of reading and understanding of synergetics. But what really jumped out at me is that, that he answered my question. <laughs> uh, when I read his literature, uh, the the uh, number of parts that interacting parts to form a system, he was very clear the answer is four. And that's when I eventually then was introduced to the tetrahedron and the uh, structure of the carbon molecule and the essence of life. Um, but Synergetics is a very difficult book, at least it was for me. Uh, I've, I've got, I have many sort of bits and pieces out of it that have been very helpful. And it was Critical Path when uh, it came along. It was an easier read and it, would, it allowed me to, to sink my, my thoughts into more of what Fuller was all about. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. He introduced through through uh, that book, for me, the concept of livingry and weaponry. And of course, that's very critical in terms of social living and to be able to have a focus on livingry rather than weaponry. But one of the interesting things was that I spent a six month academic appointment at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Bombay in 1994. And one of the things that really intrigued me uh, was. Fuller's reference to Thomas Malthus and the setting up of the British East Indian Company in the 1600s. And when, even though I was familiar with the concept of East Indian, when I went to India, I really became intrigued with why do we call Indian people East Indians? And why do East India or Indian people call themselves East Indians? <laughs> Um, and that's when I, I, I came face to face with the time zones and the power of the British Empire. And so the zero starting point is in London. And so you have to go east and then south to India. So you begin to get that idea of, of uh, India is south and east or East Indian. Um, the other thing about Thomas Malthus was his notion that you have to earn a living. And if you can't earn a living, then um, you don't deserve to be on this earth. 
Uh, and it kind of fit with some early social concepts about uh, English poor laws and deserving and undeserving. Um, so again, critical path helped me sort of dig into that deeper. The other thing about critical path, what was really interesting for me was his theory, his idea of where humanity started. And it was fascinating to, to read his section on thinking that it may in fact have been in Southeast Asia rather than in Africa. Um, and I've always been intrigued with uh, <clears throat> why that was the case in his mind and why um, all the evidence seems to point to Africa still. But uh, anyway, that's just a couple of things that really got me intrigued with critical past and want to read it deeper. And and it was a it made more <clears throat> quicker sense to me rather uh, as opposed to digging further into synergetics. So that's my opening oh, remarks on that. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, anybody, uh, Richard and anybody else, if you want to add anything to your comments, just go ahead and type exclamation mark uh, in the chat and you can you can go. So next up is going to be Kirby followed by uh, Stroopy. So Kirby, uh, feel free to comment on the entire corpus of Bucky, where, but where the critical path fits in, what you think of it? Go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you very much. I don't have prepared remarks, but I will do my best. I, I do have the book itself. Uh, I have a hard cover of it. Where I would contextualize it, uh, another book that is much less known, but also by Fuller, I'm holding it up here. It's called Tetris Scroll. And this comes after Critical Path, and it kind of shows you where he was going with some of this. What's interesting to me right now about Critical Path is it's got a foreword and an introduction both. And I think it's in the foreword that he quotes E.E. E. Cummings, or he talks about a poet's advice and so forth. And it becomes a question early on, at what level of literalness does he want us to really take his speculative prehistory, which is what this guy, the new biography I, I mentioned by Alex Navallo Lee about Bucky, he's coined the term the Naga story, N-A-G-A. -A. That's a kind of a name for a dragon or a Polynesia snake. He's using that to sort of brand Fuller's very peculiar world history, which is a sort of countervailing a tale to everything that we've learned, right? And he kind of, what Critical Path establishes for me is Fuller's signature contrarianness. Almost everything he writes is somehow counter to our prevailing intelligence, including all this stuff about the tetrahedron. He's the only philosopher I've ever met who questions whether our dedication to the right angle was a huge mistake. I mean, what other author has even offered that as a critique, but he takes that and runs with it. And Critical Path, it opens with what he calls speculative prehistory. And it sort of all starts in, in uh, Polynesia, in this idyllic Garden of Eden, where everything's perfect. And he doesn't have UFOs. Like some authors, when they get really speculative and they go back into, into the past, it's all about chariots of the gods and help from ETs and stuff. And he doesn't go there. He doesn't have ETs. But he does have a model of the universe in mind where intelligent life has always been here and it's like moves around somehow. So he thinks of us as somehow, he thinks of the actual stars as somehow being part of a big computer program that's somehow transmitting instructions and that we are sort of the creation of sunlight somehow. And again, it's very cosmic. It's it's like you're reading some old time Native American story of the birth of the earth or something. To me anyway, it comes across as very much mythology, but a refreshing one because it wasn't so long ago that here in the West, let's call it the West, we were using the Tower of Babel as our creation myth in a way. It's about Noah and how there was no humans hardly because everyone got wiped out in the flood and there was Noah and his family. And those people went on to establish the Tower of Babel community, 
which got very ingrown and they were all thinking they could build a tower to God. And the confusion of tongues led to this diaspora where they spread on, around the world and each one of Noah's sons is kind of behind a different race of human beings. And I only go over this because it wasn't so long ago that people took all that literally in like the 1800s, this would be taught in school perhaps. And so here we are with Bucky and he's just giving us this entirely different sort of almost biblical seeming symbolic tale. And I think that's where he's kind of going with Tetris scroll, which was actually printed on giant triangular. Uh, it was a work of art and only a few were made. Some 50 were printed. A friend of mine has one of the originals, but Tetris scroll was almost um, like a holy text and then it tried to take the form of a giant stone sculpture or something like this. Anyway, uh, Kirby, Kirby, yeah. I have to, I have to interject here. Please yeah. tell us more about this Tetra scroll. Um, well, let's see. Uh, I just was holding it up here a second ago, but it fills a whole gymnasium or some. It's in art museums when you are see mm -hmm. a traveling exhibit of Bucky stuff. Mm -hmm. Tetra scroll will take up an entire room. And each page is like three foot by three foot triangle. And it's got a big drawing on it, like a hand drawing. And then a lot of little bit of writing, which is explaining the drawing really. But you can get it in soft cover. You can get it on Amazon as a hard cover. It's like the original was made to take up a lot of room and is very heavy. It all folds up into one nice big triangular package. And my friend, Sam Lanahan, he has one. It weighs hundreds of pounds. It takes like two people to carry it. And then you unfold it somewhere. We've what been planning it? to do, yes. Yeah, so that's the well, what, what does it cover? What does it cover? What, what is it about? What does it? Well, it's kind of, again, like critical path. It's except that it actually brings Adam and Eve into it. It talks about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and the forbidden fruit, the knowledge they were not supposed to have is something to do with the world is round. So the apple becomes a metaphor for the earth being round. And Eve becomes a metaphor for the ship that Adam rides. So why we say Eve is made of Adam's rib is because a ship has ribs. He's always into this image of people who sail the world in boats. And when they get to the shore, they flip the boats over. And that's why when you look up and see the ribs of your boat above you, we call those eaves. <laughs> so there's a lot of good puns going on wow. here. Wow. Even puns on the word pun in some passages. <laughs> but in Critical Path, he's giving a whole story of history. And it's fascinating. Once you get beyond the fact that it starts in Polynesia and somehow humans are more related to whales and dolphins than to apes, in his mind, and it makes me think of John Lilly and who his contemporaries were. You can remember that around the time Bucky was super popular and writing Critical Path, there was this guy named John Lilly who thought maybe he could get in telepathic communication with dolphins by taking lots of drugs and stuff. And he was a very straight kind of <laughs> academic guy in background. By this time, you could say he was off the deep end. He's the one who invented isolation tanks where you just float they're popular now and here in Portland, you just uh, sensory deprivation. So he would go in a sensory deprivation tank, take drugs and try to tele, tele, telepathically communicate with dolphins. And I just wanted to say this is all going on during Bucky's lifetime. And maybe, you know, when he starts his speculative prehistory and critical path, just look for that. And the other one thing I'll say, I won't say much more right now. I've been talking a while. I realize that, but it's something to look at throughout Critical Path as you're reading it, is his relationship, how he's like, in what sense is he addressing US-Russian relations? Because that's big right now, of course. And he's growing up just like we did through all these decades of like tension and Cold War and Cuban Missile Crisis and all this stuff. And so in light of what's going on now in the world, read Critical Path as kind of, how does he deal with the Russians and what does he talk about? And how is how is that a theme? And I ask that as a question. I won't go on into what he says. Sounds but it is a history of the world. It's history of the world. It starts in the distant past and it goes on into the future. 
and gives us a positive vision of what we could do with the future. Because as we were just hearing, he brings up Thomas Malthus and he thinks the really fundamental question we really need to ask ourselves is, is there enough in principle of resources, physical and metaphysical, to take care of people? Do we have a right to be melodramatic and tragic about our situation? Or is the planet well enough endowed that with our intelligence, we could do well for ourselves? And he comes to that as his conclusion that in principle, we could succeed here as a species. It's not a dire situation of lethal lack of life support, even with the population and so on, but not if we just sit back and do nothing, right? It's like, it's up to us to do what needs to be done. So critical path is also an exhortation, his usual, why he was popular, because people wanted to hear this message, which I think is a good one. So it's a world history and it's trying to get you to really want this future that he's sort of, vaguely creates for you, but he's not trying to dictate it's got to be like this, right? He doesn't have the the answers and stuff like that. So that's all I'll say. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Kirby. Uh, Richard, you have, you wanted to add something. Yeah, I just wanted to say something about uh, Tetra Scroll because Please. in part, uh, it was Bucky ta <clears throat> uh, telling his daughter Allegra about the the three bears. And one of the things that really struck me about that is that he 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 pictured the Trinity and and then he showed with the tetrahedron that in order to have a Trinity, in order to observe it, there has to be an observer. And as soon as he did that, he was then able to put together the idea that minimum um, uh, system structure has got to be four. And it has to be the observer and the observed um, uh, in it together. So um, he, he, he really develops that very nicely in Tetra Scroll, which is really his um, story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears to his daughter when she was a young girl in the 30s. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, next up is uh, Strupi. Strupi, what, what do you think about Critical Path and where it fits into Bucky's corpus? Folks, if anybody else has read Critical Path, go ahead and type yes in the chat and I will call upon you next. Strupi, go ahead. Right. Well, um, hi, first welcome, of all. Welcome, welcome. I'm a little welcome. late. <laughs> But That's all right. I, I am so delighted you're you're joining us. I know it must be like three thirty there. 3 yeah, yeah. The but I've 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 managed to uh to keep playing with the creating something <clears throat> new for so long that it was late enough to stay up. <laughs> um. So critical path, I must admit, is a little uh while ago that I read it, but just listening to the others, um. Kind of bringing back, bringing it back to my mind. Um, there's a lot to be said about Critical Path and Tetra Scroll as well. Marvelous stuff. Um, I think that the term Critical Path originates with the space program, and I mean the industrialist, uh, futurist, whatever they wanted to call him. Buckminster Fuller, of course, was very much. Um, amazed or intrigued by the space travel stuff because for once people were not thinking as as deeply entrenched in the nonsense of the the compression based thinking so i think really from his point of view and th this this storyline that that kirby spoke to of the the naga the, the snake and Eve and uh, the apple and all these things. It's it's the most wonderful uh, reading of that story, I think. And it, to my mind, it makes more a lot more sense than what the Bible is usually translated as. Um, and I could go deeper into that, but I I want to point out that Bucky was a sailor. He was a, a sea man you know, somebody who grew up on the waves and with the water and with the wind. And he recognized wind doesn't blow, it sucks. So, you know, if if we're sailing, we're not being blown by the wind, we're, we're being drawn by it. 
and he realized that and I think that really sets him apart. I mean, from what I've been witnessing from some people from Aotearoa, some of the Maori people, you know, there there seems to be a lot more awareness for, for the deep history of these people. But I think other than that, Bucky might be the only one I've ever read who drew up a, a complete world history, not based on the land, but on the water. And that in itself is a very unique perspective because, you know, there is something to be said about being sea, uh, being ship shape, right? Because if we're ship shape, then our structure that we're creating doesn't have any redundancy. It doesn't have dead weight. And we wouldn't put something down on a ship because it would just fall down with the next wave. We would put it on a string and hang it up putting it in tensacrity with the whole ship so it can balance on its own. And, you know, seamanship is that the, the whole Marlin spike seamanship, all of this working with ropes and lines and knots is perfect, uh, practical synergetics from long before history. Um, and that stuff that Bucky alludes to, because he points out that, you know, the, the words of the, the numbers and, other terminologies seem to be closely related all over the world, as as well as this this whole thing with Naga, the, the snake, snake goddess, um, Naga, Nagina, and then Nagini uh, and navy and navigation, all these words with the Na, and then also the Raga and the Saga of the seafaring peoples of you know India and uh, Europe and these generations of, of names that they can remember by means of their ship, right? So every member of the ship remem re reminds them of a member of their family tree. And you know how the, the, these um, Polynesian uh, wayfinders were able to, uh, th they used binary numbers and they had these rings on their, their body that, according to Bucky, were actually calculation devices, right? Ones that you wouldn't drop on the ship because you couldn't lose them if they're stuck on your finger or your foot or whatever. So there's so much there. And I think when it comes to, you know, what, what Kirby was saying that we this question of do we have enough for everyone the answer is yes but only if we don't waste everything in the pursuit of you know linear time and square miles of land that someone wants to fight over for to to own that so-called real estate and then have this this notion of cubic space without gaps this all of that is designing a world in which there isn't enough to go around because nothing can go around in a box so you know i think it's it's as if like this this uh, quote so often mentioned um of ephemeralization the the notion that we can do way more with less the in inverse is true as well. If we keep on the, the mistaken path of Greek geometry and everything that comes out of that as a consequence, then we're doing way less with way more, right? And that is that is the story of our civilization, really, from bu bubble bubbles tower to what what we see happening today. And I think Bucky's thinking is a is, is it's a true antidote to that because it gives a perspective, a, a whole range of perspectives that go well beyond anything that we, we've been conceptualizing and thinking about beforehand. And well, maybe some, some more words about Tetra Scroll because I really love that book. As Richard said, it's, it's originally a bedtime story which developed over time and um, I think in the very beginning, he, he puts a disclaimer that says, you know, if you're a kid and you're reading this and there's words you don't know, 
please look them up in a dictionary. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. awesome, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but then that that entire book, I mean, I've I've only had the, the pleasure of reading it as a Google book, but the the introduction tells about the actual real books and um, I, I don't know of that many other books that are triagonal or hexagonal in shape. So that sets it apart already because if it's that shape, it's going to fold and unfold in, in that scroll, in that tetra scroll. You can have one four eyes being the, 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 the red part and that keeps rolling up the tape that goes from the other that is unread yet. Mm -hmm. And there's these lithographs in it that, that Bucky drew by hand. And for instance, in particular, I think that the way he, he captures in those some of the essences of synergetics so clearly, and then also this whole storyline of, of the, the, the sea, sea history. And maybe because I've got the the snake here now um what bucky read into the story of adam and eve is really special because as kirby said he's he, he pointed out that if god took out adam's rib to create eve then that would have been the death the, the death of adam so that would be the end of the story it couldn't be that so what could it be well here's the seafaring people with their seagoing vessels that are off all the time uh, read as female because they, they are bodies able to carry bodies and they apparently at some point got the idea perhaps from their own bodies or indeed you know the bodies of whales and others that this rib cage would allow them to create the seagoing vessels and then they, you know, they, they figured out that not only could they paddle on their, or just drift on their, on their rafts, but they could put up a sail and why, with that actually go just as that snake, you know, that snake, the, the naga, it's both the, the wave line at the horizon, but it's also the, the tech, the tacking of the ship going against the will of God, if you like, because the wind apparently is drawing the other way, but the, the ship can go against it. So with that, you know, comes this snake off the tree of knowledge, and the snake is has got this apple on them, and quite uh, clearly points out to Adam and Eve that indeed the earth is a sphere and if we travel around it one way we'll get back to where we began and yeah i mean i i don't know if there is uh, any evidence ever to be had to to verify these stories and i don't know if for instance there is much merit to the theory of the 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 water apes or whatever they called them aqua apes aquatic apes because apparently our bodies have some signs of a, 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 a part of our stories where we were very, very um, much involved in the waters. And these things are so hard to get at because one quality of a, a truly synergetic culture is that it leaves no trace, you know, because it's, it's treading so lightly. And that is so utterly different from what we're used to now, where everything, every single act of just living or surviving in this game creates waste and destruction. And, you know, it must, must have been the, the, the alienation of the Europeans of their own roots that had ha happened because of the empires coming before and colonizing them in the old days, that they were un in incapable, in incapable of recognizing the, the deep knowledge and technology of the, the people that they then colonized themselves because they, they couldn't see their technology as such because, you know, look at this landscape, it's all 
pristine. The waters are clear, abundant game, forests everywhere. Let's cut it down, make fields. And, you know, still, we wouldn't have had colonization and the, the age of empires and these things if it weren't for the ships. And Bucky is always drawing that connection back and pointing out how the enterprises, these companies and all of that maybe have might have been sort of like a corruption of a, a very old, ancient, synergetic legacy that has been um, handed down through the hands and the lines of the sailors, which, you know, we find in theater and every place, but it's... Yeah, I think it's a very, very interesting kind of read, and I'm looking forward to hear what, uh, what you all make of it. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Strupi. Now, I want to call upon those who are not familiar with Bucky to talk about what do they expect to gain from focusing on Bucky's thoughts. So I will, I will get things started, but I would love to hear from many, uh, from anybody, what, what is it that excites them about going on this journey of really diving deep into Bucky's thought? Now, thanks to CJ, we have had more than a flavor of Bucky. What CJ did was that he took Bucky's ideas and divided them into little digestible chunks. And he's been doing meetups on that in Greater Philadelphia Society for about 10 years and 52 Living Ideas for about two, you know, two years or so, two and a half years, uh, he did that. So we are, we're actually familiar. And I got very excited about Bucky and I went, I did an entire you know, series in parallel on the operating manual. Um, so I will start by talking about what I am hoping to gain by diving deep into Bucky. And then I will go to Maritza, uh, talk, you know, she's going to be leading this, uh, you know, our exploration of critical path. And then I will, you know, ask anybody else uh, what they expect to gain from Bucky. What I will say is that, you know, just in these last month or so that I've been really focusing on Bucky, several things have become clear to me. One is that his approach is an integrated approach. He always brings all the relevant things together, never dis disparages any, any part of reality whether human, conscious, or physical. He, it is trying to embrace, he's trying to embrace everything. And he's trying to see connections between everything. He's seeing, whenever he's looking at something, he's seeing the holes, the different holes that it is part of, always. And it is, he's looking at, anything as a whole. So I think whole, focus on whole, focus on integrations, focus on connections um, is one big thing I see. The second is that he has an engineer's and mathematician's mind that he's always looking for minimum systems. It's not just that he's, go he's just kind of um, passively looking at the world, but he's looking at patterns in the world. And he's trying to look at fundamental patterns, always. Thing I like most is that he's a truly independent mind. He is encountering all these questions as if he had not heard of anything, you know, what other people have said about it. And he's just looking at reality and say, what do I see? What patterns do I see? And he is speaking so 
from his heart with clear conscience, truth that he sees. He puts it in explicit forms. It's, and he does. I also like the fact that he talks forever, okay? Because he actually wants to communicate what he holds, not as a, you know, slogan, not as just something, but he wants to actually tell you what he thinks. So many of so many people who are who have dis discovered Bucky when he was alive always start by saying, I was at this lecture, it went on for 12 hours and it continued and continued and continued. It's it's a mind really enthralled with this world and is engaging it in an authentic way with really powerful, simple ideas and has the generous spirit of inviting everybody to share in them and to work together. That's what I like most about Bucky, even with this very small introduction. You know, I'm, I'm just beginning to look at Bucky and this is what I see. Um, Maritza, what about you? So I am also a novice uh, here. Um, my introduction to Bucky was with the uh, Greater Philadelphia Thinker Society with um, CJ, you know, now for about six, seven years, he's done, um, you know, uh, discussions on various topics um, that where the foundation is Bucky. And the fascinating thing is that for a while, I wasn't even entirely aware that it was Bucky that I was learning about and um, looking at various topics with Bucky at the foundation. It took me a while to realize that that's what CJ was in fact doing. Um, uh, and, you know, throughout the years, I, I grew to, you know, really enjoy hearing many of his perspectives. And so I started looking at, you know, some of his works myself. A Critical Path is not one that I had previously read um, so I'm excited to be um, going through it here with you. You know, um, I find that the best way to, like I get the best out of reading a book when I have to be the one in the front kind of helping to shape the conversation. Um, for me, the most exciting thing is that I get to be the, you know, the, the unknown face, but I will have all of you experts there to, to point out nuances that I may not have gotten or may not have seen. So I, I'm, I really do enjoy, I've been doing this with Srikant now for a few years, about two, two and a half, the same time. So I came here to 50 to 11 ideas with CJ. It's all Joe's fault. He brought us um, Think of Society folks here to um, 50 to 11 ideas. And um, I love the, the manner of reading books together that we, we've been developing and forging here. And on this this platform, in that you know when we do a deep dive, it's such a rich way. Like you know, I'll read the book maybe once or twice because you know I get nervous. I'm going to be in the front. I want to make sure I I, am, I think I'm understanding it. I might you know I'll definitely write notes. I may put something up for presentation, but then I actually don't really say much <laughs> because what happens is people who also have read it will come and they'll they'll speak and they'll they'll invariably, they will enable me to view that chapter in a way that I might not have. So now when I go back on my own time and reread it, I get so much more out of it because now I have your inputs and your different perspectives. So I, I think that, um, you know, what I've read so far, I'm only on like chapter two, right? And I had to go back and read. I was telling you, I couldn't get past the intro without reading it like three, three or four times. I'm fascinated by the history um, aspect. You know, some of what um, Stroopy said was, it's like the, the Maori people, you, where do you ever hear anyone bring them up when they're going to start talking about systems? It, it does, it's not, I've never seen that before. So it's fascinating. And, um, you know, I, I know bits I've listened to many of his um, lectures that he's given. Um, so I'm really looking forward to 
going through this book and seeing more of his um, ideas, maybe in more of a um, coalesced version. And but mostly, I'm just I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts and um, seeing what we all come up with together. Thank you. Wonderful. I would like to add one one more thing, and then um, I want to invite others to talk about what they are excited about here. Okay. Um, so the point I want to add is that we had 52 idea, uh, 52 living ideas. We have done several things that have really prepared us well. For instance, we looked at Louis Sullivan. We did a really deep dive into Louis Sullivan. He's the guy who came up with form ever follows function. Um, I mean, we have done 33 meetups, almost like 70 hours of real deep dive into his work. I, I'm a big fan of Louis Sullivan. So the idea of that you always start with function, you never, you always look at forms as being the product of functions and never lose that. Um, you know, that's what I've gotten from Louis Sullivan. Um, we've also gone through things like, uh, we've gone through the book, The Design Way, which was one of CJ's absolute favorite books. Um, and that has been amazing, you know, uh, Harold Nelson has participated in the meetups on, you know, the author of the book has participated. By the way, he's coming next Wednesday and he's going to be talking about his new venture of actually teaching design to everybody. This is in the same vein of Bucky of saying that, you know, this design is not just for architects. This is something that all of us have to be using all the time and we can do that um, and I'm going to be interviewing him on his new venture on the new school that he has just uh, you know just launched so I'm very very excited um, that he you know he's, he'll be coming uh, he's become a very good friend because he's been watching us do meetups on his work he was here for almost every one of those meetups and um so it's uh, so I'm, that that's very exciting. So let's go to um, Kirby, followed by Lisa. Kirby, I'd, I'd be okay if Lisa wants to go first because I've sure. talked. Let, let's do that. Let's do that. Um, okay. Lisa, go ahead. Okay, I um, joined this not knowing how relatable I I am to CJ's thinking and also Bucky Bucky's process thinking, systems thinking. So I'm excited to learn more about the spheres that I watched um, yesterday's video um, of uh, that man that was just <laughs> speaking. And I see that um, how I break things down and build it up, how I may have six eyes in my view and may be missing the other two, eight or, or 12. And I think the dialogue and the books and the deep dive will help me grasp the things that I'm missing. And I, I can't believe I found you guys. <laughs> I talk, I talk in such weird terms because I make up all my vocabulary for the way I think. And these new terms are so relevant to what my, my vocabulary is. But um, I'm very excited that you're showcasing this for um, for the year or more. Thank you. Appreciate Wonderful. it. Wonderful. Let, let me actually call on people. So uh, anybody, you know, Brian, Becky, Evanique, Judy, if any of you want to share what what uh, why you want to participate in this, uh, I would really appreciate that. So we're going to start with Evanique followed by Becky. Evanique. Yeah, um, you know, I heard CJ talk about Bucky all the time, and I'm like, who is this guy? And, uh, you know, I never attended the Bucky meetups. Um, and then, you know, I hear so many people get so much out of it that I'm just curious to see what I will get out of it. And I have to say, at the beginning of the year, we let, let me ask you one question. Yeah. You, you were, you did not know much about Louis Sullivan. What did you I did not know anything about Louis what Sullivan. What did you get from Louis Sullivan? 
Oh my gosh. Okay, so from Louis Sullivan, first I got the the form follows function um, narrative, which I've talked about before. But the biggest thing I got is that Louis Sullivan was his own mind. He thought in ways that were so different from other people. And I think the thing I, I admired about Louis Sullivan is that he was true to who he was. Um, you know, he was, he had integrity. He believed in his work and it didn't matter if he made money, you know, he would do what he needed to do to survive. But he was so dedicated to his work that it was almost like an obsession with him because that was what he was here to do. And he knew that. So I think that's what I loved about Louis Sullivan. Um, and, I, and, you know, like I said, him being a man of integrity and but the, it was also being an architectural mind. I always think of math for some reason. I'm like, you have to be really good at math and I stink at math. So I'm like, there's no way I'm going to get something out of this. But he's also very artistic. And I think that's one of the reasons why I ran away from Bucky because I was like, oh, that sounds mathy. I don't want to do that. So I was like, no. But then hearing everybody explain it, I have to say, Sharifi, when he did the spears, the fear, sorry, and um, the, the playing with the models, that's when I was like, okay, I'm in. <laughs> like, I, I'm in, you know, because I was like, this is not math the way I know math. And I know we talked about it in Louis Sullivan meetups too, you know, that you were like, in you and Rupali and, um, oh my gosh, Rob and Sherry were talking about math wasn't taught correctly in schools. So I, I'm curious. So that's why I'm here. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And I think, um, see, th that's the thing about great minds, right? Like Louis Sullivan or Bucky, just the contact with them. If all you get is the courage to be naive, you know, that's it. I mean, that you, you've got all really. Uh, and you, they actually demonstrate it in every sentence that they speak, everything that they do, all their designs is that. It's like, this is the best that I can think. This is the best that I understand. And they are fine just putting it out there, though it is very different from what everybody else. I think most people around us and most people throughout history have really looked to other people to say, okay, what, what am I supposed to be? And what am I supposed to think? And what am I supposed to do? And they have either explicitly or mostly implicitly just they just absorb that and imitate that. So they're imitative and not saying, not having this authentic connection to reality or to themselves. They're basically saying no to the world and no to their own self. And in the process, they have nothing. You know, they think they have something, but all of that, what they have is from you know what other people value not what they themselves value they have lost the capacity to value so that uh is is wonderfully put next up is becky followed by brian becky so my first um i guess intro to bucky really came through cj but it was through comprehensivity Mm -hmm. And um, and it was always secondhand because we we're studying a lot of what CJ had written about Bucky. Um, I, I mean, I might have read one small article when we we're talking about um, cybernetics, but um, but for the most part, it was always secondhand. And uh, when we started doing Design Way, which you've invited me to, uh, because I it was my first formal introduction to design thinking. Um, it was so uh, different to, to have all those concepts laid out. And I didn't realize that a lot of my trial and error and discovery of, um, of, of uh, design was, um, was like laid out through that book. And uh, when I ended up reading uh, the operating manual 
um, for Spaceship Earth maybe a month ago or a few weeks ago. That was like my, everything kind of clicked together with CJ, with Zine Wei, um, a lot of it resonated with me. And I thought, oh, well, I never knew what Bucky was all about. And, and, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I, I didn't know much about Bucky. Um, and when we were talking about um, the operating manual, someone had mentioned, okay, well, he was a philosopher, he was the, an architect, he was a, an engineer, mathematician, like all these things. And I was like, you know what? I, I, I'm really interested. I would like to know more. Um, I have a bit of a background in math, but not a heavy one on geometry. And interacting with, uh, with, with Tom the other day and listening to Struki and watching um, both of them really discover mathematics in such a, um, in, in such a playful childlike way uh, was, was refreshing. Um, and, and I had mentioned this before, it, 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 I'm so quick to jump to abstractions that, that it, it, it probably um, does not stick with me as deeply because I, I, I haven't really touched it, felt it in, in a physical way. And so, um, so that was so exciting. And, um, but, but going back to Bucky, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, enthusiastic and about about all this so as a newbie um and, and a you know a, a complete um like yeah a child to this this is going to be quite an adventure for me wonderful wonderful uh becky um it's just glad to have you here and um so what i want to point out uh, so we're going to go with uh, brian uh judy and then Kirby and Stroopy. Brian, go ahead. So I like the, uh, my initial understanding is still my same understanding and my same interest. And that is that he, just as you've said, you've drawn me in with this going from the whole to the particular. And, but what I would add to it, what is intriguing me is that, uh, as opposed to some of the old wisdom traditions that we've been looking at, uh, he's doing it in a, a modern vernacular, uh, dealing with current topics, which I think is is going to be really exciting. The um, the other thing I've kind of picked up on that I think is also exciting is that he starts with his observations of nature, and the um, the tetrahedron, I think, is an example of that. And his he's observed it in nature, so he's trying to apply it uh, in his individual endeavors, excuse me, individual endeavors in the real world. And in that way, uh, his, his efforts are not so speculative. It's more, he's staying in touch with reality. He's going from the natural reality to the man-made reality. Um, I think in a very, it seems to be in a very healthy fashion. And I think it, it uh, I don't know the details yet. The, I've been very encouraged by Stroopy's talk and Tom Miller's talk. These are examples of, of how, you know, other people are running with these ideas very, very exciting and encouraging. Uh, but I think that these kind of thinking, just as Stroopy has flagged and some others, is that when you think this way from, and try to think in a, uh, in a manner that's consistent with the ways of nature, then you don't get caught up in these dead end, the dead end thinking of uh, lack of resources and the kind of panic and concern that can lead to the, you know, that leads to violence in many occasions. So I think it's a, his way of looking at things, starting with observations of nature and building on that, 
uh, trying to build a real world based on that is uh, is very encouraging, very exciting. Wonderful, thank you. Benny, would you like to add anything? Oh uh, yeah, um, I'll just say, well, I'm totally new to Buckminster Fuller when you mentioned him the other day. It was like a name, like I knew I'd heard it, but you know, I couldn't tie anything with it. And when we went in the first meeting, they were saying something about the geodesic dome. And I was like, oh yeah, I remember the dome, you know, but um, so I was intrigued. I did read the spaceship earth and that was the only thing I've read. And, um, but I mean, I was drawn in, you know, because for one thing it's, he's very strategic in his thinking and for another thing, he, he seems to be kind of very positive where there's so much negativity in the world right now. And that, you know, that we're not in a world of scarcity, that we have the potential to, to have everybody live well. And, um, you know, he, he bases this on, you know, since he, I guess, is engineering or architect background. I mean, you know, like, concrete examples of things that he's thought of but i i think that um and just then his i think that idea um <clears throat> that you know he says a lot of what the current culture is and you know that it's you need to shift that way of thinking but it seems to be in some way where you know we could move forward and um actually try to make things better for people rather than just kind of sit and, and say, oh, you know, like the world is falling apart and climate change and, oh, look, now they're having a lot of rain in California and, you know, things are gonna get worse and worse and worse and there's nothing we can do. That he really feels that man being the, the mind in the universe, if he uses his mind can, you know, improve things. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Uh, next up is Judy, Kirby, and Stroopy. Judy. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to express my desire to continue studying Buckminster, Buckminster Fuller. And um, I started at, in the 1970s and early 1980s as a New Age eco warrior. We actually built a geodesic dome in a cloud forest in a, an area that wasn't preserved yet by the United Nations and the world global organizations, but we bought land, a group of us to preserve it and fought to make that area a, pres a preservation forest, an international rainforest, actually it's a cloud forest. <clears throat> and um, so, but we built a geodesic dome right in the middle of it. And we would sit there for hours and just- How, how big was the geodesic it dome? Pretty big. It, I mean, uh, uh, 10, 15 people would could meditate inside of it. <clears throat> so we would sit inside the dome and we did it with a plastic that we could see clear and um, clear through. And we would watch all these birds. And it was just because the Quetzales and other wonderful, incredible birds that are never held in captivity because they die. So we would watch these birds and just, you know, just, you know, just sit there and, and thanks to this dome that we built. And we, but we did it as a communal effort. We were all eco warriors. As I said, we were buying land, we were preserving it, we were uh, <clears throat> making it sure that it was going to be a, um, a preserved area, and it is still today. And we planted trees, and we did a lot of um, wonderful things. You know, we influenced others. We read Stuart Brandt, and and uh, you know, we were just like eco warriors, and we recycled everything when the work wasn't even existent. And um, so, yeah, and then so that was my my main entry into Bucky's world. Although we were more holistic 
and, and Bucky was part of it. It wasn't like it was like we were we weren't following Bucky only. We were using all his his dome and his, his systems thinking and his process thinking and his innovation, but we were more in the holistic space more than anything. And um, but without even knowing where all these words came from. So today, I mean, we were just living it. We were just not even thinking too much about it. We were just living it. So the thing is that today with your living um, meetups, um, it's just coming back, you know, like like floods of information that's coming back to my mind and to my heart and to my soul, just remembering. And just now for the first time, I'm trying to understand it logically and understanding by reading his books and the, and by interchanging with everyone in this in this your panels as much as I can learn about um, his thoughts and his critical approach to, to, to process and, and, and to improvisations and to thinking out loud and all the things that we're learning about him. So, I mean, it was just, so I wanted to thank you. Another thing that I wanted to say is that <clears throat> without even knowing also, I think he influenced training a lot because I'm a trainer by profession and we studied, I remember studying uh, systems approach to training, um, quality management with um, <clears throat> the continuous process improvement and all these keywords are there. So I think that he also made a great, great, contribution to training and to develop adult development and adult education with his systems, open systems approach to teaching and to education. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. So I, you know, I'm always uh, in awe, you know, um, I want to say one thing um, about how we have dealt with books. Um, because this, you know, we've been doing this for some time at 52 Living Ideas. And we always have a mix of people, some of whom will know a lot and some of whom who don't know much. Okay. And I like to do things where I am in the in the in the latter category. You know, I, that's my favorite, those are my favorite meetups when I don't know much. Um, and the beauty of it is that, you know, we are, we are basically a learning community. You know, what we are engaging is in joint exploration. And what I've found, you know, there have been times where I have known more. Um, invariably, people who know a lot come off from this experience saying, oh, I had not seen this, I had not seen this, because people are genuinely asking questions from a perspective, from an angle that they may not have seen. Like people like Yogeshwar, people like, um, you know, Jason, people like um, Gary, people like, uh, you know, just all, all of these folks who have really immersed themselves find that they also have a lot to learn. Partly because the topics that we choose, the subjects that we study are incredibly deep rich. So for example, you know, Tao Te Ching or Bhagavad Gita or Gospel of John or the Design Way or Louis Sullivan, you know, all of these are incredibly, or Goethe or uh, Dante or, you know, all of these are incredibly deep works. And what we're doing here is actually a much older tradition of the scribal age, where instead of just you sitting in your room with a personal copy of the book that has come off the printing press, you're actually going to a book and you are reading out the book, you're speaking to others, it's, it's a group of people, all of whom are focused on a work, focused on reading something, talking about it, and then writing something on their own, in their own notes, keeping track of everything, and then coming back and speaking about it. So there is this loop of oral communication that envelopes the work. And that is a way in which you can make these works part of you. 
you can build it into your thoughts, your emotions, your actions, your intuitions. So it is a very, very powerful way of approaching it. And we are going to do the same thing uh, for, for this book. All right, let's go to Kirby followed by Strupi. Kirby. Oh, thanks for letting me talk um, again. Um, I'm really fascinated by everyone's, you know, I like the freshness of these meetups where people haven't studied this stuff a lot. And I do the same thing. I really like your Gospel of John stuff that you're doing. I, I haven't joined in person, but I, I'm watching this, some of these YouTubes. I see where you've got your tetrahedron going. And Shrikan, I really like your diagrammatic approach. When you take up a thinker, you you think and you kind of really have these powerful diagrams going pretty quickly that I also find it accessible and useful and helpful. So to take Bucky's work and sort of percolate it through a group like this is a very exciting experiment. And I'm looking forward to how it goes. And I wanted to echo what you said, Shrikant, about his openness and just the first sentence of the foreword of Critical Path, he writes, it is the author's working assumption that the words good and bad are meaningless. This kind of echoes Nietzsche actually beyond good and evil, but he's about to tell the whole history of the world and who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. And that would be typical of a history, but he's not really demonizing anybody. And part of his good future for humanity is that you know we didn't get there by proving any one particular group had we didn't get there by by force i guess you could say he's he's open to everybody and therefore it's not about human nature that he picks a fight with he's telling himself since 1927 that he wants to help all humanity but instead of like preaching to us about how we must reform our inner nature or change our ways He's very accepting of humans and he thinks design and therefore the why we call it the design science revolution don't change the human change their environment is what he's often famous for saying two more things critical path look for the pattern where he talks about the sea people the sort of pastoral people who are on foot with their animals. He says, following their animals. I like this, you know, it's like, if you're a pastoral tribe, you go where the goats go and you sort of travel the world on foot. He makes that like a cultural motif. We have the seagoing people and that's where your great pirates come in later in operating manual. You've got your people on foot with their farm animals. And then you've got who he calls the horse mounted bullies. And I think of all those paintings I've seen of a great general always on a horse, right? Or the Mongols, you know, the, the bullies, the, the attackers are the horsemen of bullies. Anyway, he's got these big patterns going. They're very fun. And he lived a long time. So a lot of critical path is him putting it together through his own eyes. Just, just to say again about his sort of liking people, across the spectrum there's passages if you dig into his own autobiography and stuff where he's in chicago in his younger days he's already been in the navy and he's hanging out with al capone's people right these are the liquor runners this is prohibition and he's like hanging out with these gangsters and he's drinking and he's hanging with them and he's like i understand these people i get it and I've also had lunch with JP Morgan bankers. He's like saying, I cover the spectrum. I meet these people from all walks of life. And what I notice about me is I kind of get along with all of them. I kind of want to try to explain each side to the other side. And this often gets me in a difficult position. It's like, I of all people need to learn to do my own thinking or I'm really going to get in trouble because I'm so... I'm such a pushover for all these different sort of tribes and so on. The last thing I'll say is Philadelphia. What is his connection to Philadelphia? On the cover of Critical Path, there's this other name, Kiyoshi Kuramiya, and I put some stuff in the chat. He's worth tracking and getting a sense of his biography and this fact that he worked with Bucky says a lot because he's a major activist, a civil rights guy, 
knew Martin Luther King very well and all these things. And I got to meet him a few times when I came to Philadelphia. And he had come to Philadelphia to study architecture and he'd found Lloyd Kahn and somebody. But then he found Bucky and he felt he'd really found the great mind, the architect that he wanted to study. And so that was, he moved to Philadelphia, Buckminster Fuller Institute at that time was in Philadelphia. And there's a lot of Philadelphia in the, in the Bucky literature. I guess I'll end at that point. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Kirby. Uh, so Kirby is going to be presenting his uh, deck on uh, dimensions in uh, synergetics. You know, CJ told me, CJ had very specific instructions for me, you know. He, he, he planned everything. So it's, it's like he, he said, you know, you have to approach Kirby and get him to present his slides. He has this amazing uh, deck and uh, he's going, you know, Kirby is going to be presenting it um, on- uh, 29th, I think. Yes, January 29th. 29th. Yeah, uh, I'll just say about it, you know, please. Fuller kind of branded around this 4D and it, the whole, um, late 1800s, early 1900s, there was a lot of talk about the fourth dimension. As you know, Einstein picked up on it. I mean, it became more established as to what we mean by it. But what I talk about in my deck, just to be brief, is it never did settle down to just one meaning for a fourth dimension. There's the Einstein three dimensions plus time, but then there's what's called extended Euclideanism, where you can have as many dimensions as you want, and linear algebra math will take you there. And so there's already two different meanings of 4D, and I'm going to argue that with Fuller, given his contrarian approach to everything, he's going to take it yet in another direction, what we mean by 4D. But he's not trying to contradict these others. He's just, here's another way to talk. Math does not have to boil down to the one and only sort of totalitarian one right way to talk. You can have three or five different maths, no problem. Okay, so that's a preview. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Kirby. Next up is Strupi. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I can't begin. It's so, um, so inspiring and so, uh, you know, such a mind tickle to be around you guys. And it's like so many resonances that, that come up. And one thing I want to, wanted to say, even after the first round that, that Kirby sp spoke was, I love the fact how you always have your eyes closed when you speak from your heart, because it's the same thing when I'm playing music by heart. You know, it's like reading your heart rather than reading a page. And I think that that uh, that is a beautiful trait. And another thing that that Shrikant, you spoke to the value and, um, you know, form follows function. And I think there's a there's a level of poetry to synergetics that we're not familiar with when it comes to shapes and forms, because indeed there is way more functions in a form than we are used to. And there are way more forms to, to be picked from according to, we need this function to be addressed or that one. And, you know, I, I said before, our civilization is one that is uniquely illiterate when it comes to form, because we've been brought up with a uniform, one fits all, one size fits all. You know, like if if I wanted to to break it down to the to the plane, and I asked someone, please draw a small shape, they draw a small square, and then a, a big shape is a big square. But you know, if I want a small shape, I I, I go for a triangle, and a big shape would be a hexagon. I wouldn't choose the square because it's nothing in in the middle and and i would i was thinking you know he spoke to value and i've had this beautiful conversation i've i've got a very close friend called stephanie schwartz who's been really central also with with this project of ours called the fuller feedback systems where we're we've been trying to bring spherical thinking to to the mind of people and um we she, she actually visit visited me here and as we were speaking about you know our our difficulties to make money you know make a living 
because we're, we're already living why would why would we make anything you know and in my pers my personal thing is that i i have a very complicated uh, relationship with money because i i can't you know i can't for the life of mine put a value on what i'm doing in 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 terms of a measurement system that is clearly valuing destruction and death and war more than anything else you know in the name of profit they they've been doing the wildest things and how could i you know put use that measurement system and put myself into that so in our conversations we came up with the term intervalue rather than value because it speaks of the interval it speaks of the fact that our value our true value lies between us not within me i'm not worth anything on my own i'm only worth while with others and i th i want to bring this term up because i my sense is there's many things i want to weave back in when we continue the conversation um, on Sunday, but my sense is the most strongly drawn to give some flesh to the phrase of mind the gap, because that's something the box can't do. The box has no gaps. You know, they think you can fill all space with boxes. You can't because space time is curved and there's always going to be gaps. And within sp spherical thinking, synergetics, you know, the four eyes and the eight eyes, they are complementaries because they're always minding the gap of one another. And what is one sphere in one sense is the gap in the, in the other. Mm -hmm. And I really want to go deeper into that. Um, but maybe if I, if I may, I, I'd like to quickly show you just sure. as, a, as a kind of an idea to get a sense of what... Um, what this spherical life spherical thinking looks like and one thing to 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 put in here is also to say i i hope you can see my screen yes um yes wonderful so one thing i want to point out is um we all are spherical in nature you know our being is spherical and our minds are spherical it is just the um the, the software, so to speak, the code that we're running, the program that we've been left with that has us believe otherwise and use a frame of mind that does not allow for this to, to actually happen. And now my play today, only just today, was I remember that I, you know, I've seen videos of people from the Amazon, Amazonia, who were carrying these bags, these ba baskets on their backs that, that had this triaxial, triagonal weave pattern that is commonly known as kagome from the Japanese for eye basket. And it's a big thing in synergetics because it's one of those pattern integrities. It's a beautiful way of weaving and I've been playing with it for a while. And I wanted to figure out how do they call those baskets? So I looked for them and I found out, okay, so in English they're called tumpline. And apparently there's a couple of um, examples of tump lines with Kagome weaves from Nepal and Amazonia and other places. So I set out to make my own because I've, I've read about them and realized, okay, this stuff makes a lot of sense to carry your weight, not on the shoulders, but actually put it on the, on the head. And this was where I started from. I got two branches of a black locust that were lying outside our windows and I cut them into a dozen pieces, half of them as long as my outstretched arm to the fingertip and the other from the elbow to the fingertip. And then I began to tie them together with rope, as you can see here. And in time they took up their shape, which looks like this. And then I began the very... <laughs> excruciating process of weaving in the Kagome weave. And, you know, as, as glad as I was that I had apparently managed to, um, to teach myself the pattern of making the shape itself, the frame very well now, I, I, I apparently can do that now. I'm, I'm 
happy to say. But the weaving, I had so many, <laughs> so many weaving and weaving and unweaving. And in the end, I finished it. So this is what it looks like now. And you can see it's a wild wood structure, just as my tree ship is. The whole thing is dynamic and alive. The whole thing moves as one, which is to say all the members move. You know, it's not stuck and not rigid. And the whole thing is following the same weave pattern. Both the, the branches are and the, the, the line in there. And the idea is that you have this thumb line that you put on your forehead just above the hairline. And with that, you integrate the weight that you're carrying with your fascia. And you, you, you've got the load not on your shoulders and on your back, but actually spread out over your entire body, over the, yes, integrated. And this was what it looked like when I then went and filled it up with wood. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think this might be m most definitely more than half my weight, if not all my weight, and you know there is just line and branches the only thing i did to the branches was to cut them with a saw take off the the the, the thorns and twigs with a, an axe take a draw knife and strip the bark put some notches in with a carving knife and then strung them together with the line nothing else you know i, I i'm tempted to say no trees were harmed in the making of this right and I think that's just to give you all a sense of how, you know, synergetics isn't just what, what it looked like in Bucky's case, you know, this uh, industrial mass produ production, uh, aluminum, plastic kind of thing. But actually, it runs way deeper than that. It, it is something that if we had never learned about the cube thing and went into that we we would all be familiar with it intimately and our world would be a very different one and these things that are possible with that frame of mind are possible independent of time they could have been done by our earliest ancestors whether they were in in the seas or on the land or wherever and they are still valid and very very useful today so that's wonderful something <laughs> thank you thank you Strupi. so really looking forward to Strupi is going to be back uh this sunday at 1 p.m eastern time uh this is going to be part two and i invite if you have not watched the first video or if you were not there for the first meetup please watch the first video and uh, Strupi, you're welcome to take it whichever way you want to go from there uh, again, please take your time. We really love what you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to point out one related thing, you know, that came to my mind when Strupi was showing, you know, these people carrying these heavy, wet weights. Um, I had gone hiking, you know, when I was in college, I'd gone hiking in the Himalayas and we hiked pretty high and we had some Sherpas with us. And the thing that really I was completely struck by was not how they were carrying stuff that was very interesting, but just the way they walked. Because it's not just this is not this design is not even about making things. It's about how you use your body. And these people, they have the way they place their foot kind of pointed a little bit out outward the way their knees were a little bit bent instead of being uh, locked um, and the steady rhythm at which they walked with which they could keep walking for a long, long time with minimal effort. They very easy, like whenever they were walking, because this is of course, you know, um, not a path. This is, you know, a trail with all kinds of ups and downs and, uneven things and they would actually you know be thinking about where to put their foot what distance should be between the two feet and so they were actually that was designed in in them so it's really really fascinating to actually pay attention 
to to what you're doing and bring all of these principles uh to to bear all right yes, yes. Go ahead. if i if i just um i think what you said there is so true it is knowing our own bodies but our extended bodies too you know knowing our mind but our extended mind because that's that's really the the unspoken truth within synergetics is that our body is universe it's not just our inside this flashback thing but our entire universe is our common body and our mind is not kept within us but we're immersed within it and everything we do is an extension of the mind so as we learn by means of our hands you know the shortest way from one heart to another is through the hands and the eyes and the mouth and the ears of one another and with that we we can not only regain so much about what it is to be us you know but there's so much more we can find there that we can share with one another and i am so happy and so grateful to see that with this group i think we we with the, this project in particular i think we're really coming to a place where we're coalescing all these open threads that bucky had left when he left this plane you know when he had touched so many people and now 50 years later or whatever it is they they come out and they say you know i've been thinking about this all this time but i've been alone you know like tom your your meeting with him was so moving it was so profound to see him being recognized and being you know greeted as kin and one of the many word plays in our groups lately was rather than speaking of information which is about informing you know bringing us into the form having it be kin formation so that we have all the kin and all our forms to play with so maybe that's something we're we're doing here as well absolutely and you know i i just you know both i and becky just loved um you know doing this with uh with tom uh it was just you know it was just an incredible honor and i'm also delighted that instead of publishing you know he started by saying he was going to publish his website in a month he published it today and it's all out there because that's an actual acceleration of spread of ideas you know um and i'm going to go back you know we're going to go back there and have him walk through the website complete website giving commentary on what it is because he's done so much work on that website but him actually explaining it to everybody is also going to accelerate the spread of the ideas and all of these things interact with one another and build on one another so uh wonderful i also really appreciate that kirby you like the the gospel of john series i've spent a lot of you know the gospel of john is very close to my heart um you know uh it is something very very new to me i've been you know i've not i've not read the bible about a year ago so I'm, this is i'm again very very new at it and the tetrahedron it looks like it's the same kind of idea of that the 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 observer being added to trinity is what i also you know kind of strum, stumbled upon so i'm really now very excited about the tetra scroll and going through it and seeing the the um synergy between what i'm already thinking i'm the the thing about bucky for me is that i can clearly see that the mind is so much more you know he's done so much more he's achieved so much more than i have so it is like saying because he's far more systematic i think mathematics is far more integrated part of his thinking than mine is so i'm able to kind of see that okay you know what if i get this and it was very clear to me when i was talking to tom because tom is so handy with all of these shapes just like uh, stroopy is so 
it's a way of interfacing. See, what happens is that you can interface with reality in multiple ways. And we have some strengths which we bring, but there are other strengths too that are possible for us human beings. So what this does, this kind of interaction does, is that it opens our eyes because in if you approach something by a certain angle, maybe some things are easier to see than other angles. Like some people said, okay, I don't know whether I'll be able to take CJ's approach to things like Lisa was saying. But the, the great thing about CJ is that he, he kind of, he said, look, there are these four on-ramps and four on-ramps actually map very well to these four different, functions for different approaches, you know, one using thinking, one using kind of really kind of camaraderie kind of feeling, one using being able to manipulate things, and one uh, being able to kind of intuit, you know, see very deep insights of this. And some people kind of naturally gravitate towards one or the other. And what we are doing is that we are actually doing this, we are systematically cycling through I mean, when I'm actually scheduling the meetups, I'm kind of trying to make sure that many, many different angles are covered. So some things are going to speak to some people more than others. And because of that, they're going to go deeper into it. And as you go deeper into it, you will actually get more appreciation of each of them because both, all of them are actually leading to the same thing. So uh, I, I just love this. So this is just fantastic. Uh, start. So we're going to start with the first set. Um, uh, uh, Maritza, have you already given some thought to what we are going to start with or you will announce? Wait, so firstly, I want to tell you the schedule. We're going to do Critical Path on the second Wednesday of each month. Okay, from now, from February on, all the way, because this is Comprehensivist Wednesday's first First Wednesday of the month, we do Improv um, by Mike Amori. The second one is going to be Maritza leading Critical Path. The third one is going to be Sanjay doing meetups on neuroscience. And fourth one uh, is going to be Phil uh, working on language and what we can learn from language. So um, I want to ask uh, Maritza, Maritza, uh, do you want to talk anything more about the um, a, uh, you know about what what people can do uh what we what, what we should cover do you want to cover uh do you want to say something about that i was talking with the idea of doing the forward and the intro because i think yeah. that's robust I like that. material yeah, for yeah the first i time. think that's more than enough so so people and it's a good idea to give people a heads up right away of saying all you have to do is to read the uh forward and the intro uh and we will talk about it at length uh, again, because it's not, you know, again, for each of these works, whether it is Gita or Daudajin, we are never in a hurry. Okay, we really want to dig in deep. Uh, so it is good to start kind of slowly with a limited amount of material and that intro and forward actually lay out where he's going. And that's much more, you know, that's if you, you really need to get that. Um, and again, you know, we're going to have people, you know, I want to invite everybody, even if you have known Bucky for a long time, I, I promise you that you will learn from, from this experience. Uh, it will energize you. Um, and uh, that has been the case for everybody who has presented, because what happens is that uh, the audience here, the participants here, uh, firstly, it's not an audience. It's, uh, it's, you know, it is, participants. Uh, you know, everybody participates. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of participation and it's a very rich participation. So what we are doing for the Bucky Sundays is we are doing large, you know, kind of significant presentations with deep discussion. Here, what we are doing is mostly deep discussion. So we will typically start by, you know, this is our general pattern. So we're going to be reading introduction and the foreword. And we will go ahead and we'll start by saying, okay, what did you get from it? And we will hear everybody's comments 
on that. Uh, we might start with people who are very, very deep into it first in order to set the stage and then let everybody else um, speak. But please feel free to speak, you know, in order to kind of make your thoughts clear. Um, I strongly recommend writing and taking notes. I use bullet points, which are very effective because you always have so many things to say. Bullet points allow you to make sure that you're covered, you cover, cover that. Uh, also, when people are speaking, you can keep track of the things that really speak to you because you will have opportunity of doing seconds. So first, everybody gets to have their say. Then everybody gets to talk about what they learned from what everybody else has said. So it will be a very rich discussion and we'll walk away with, with a lot. So that's what is planned for, uh, for the Wednesdays. Um, uh, Marissa, if you uh, do, you have anything more to add, or would you like? Uh, can I go ahead and talk about the meetups coming up? No, go right ahead. I think that's the perfect setup. All right. So we are. Uh, so today is Wednesday. Tomorrow is Thursday, where we go through Gospel of John. Uh, Gospel of John. We are looking at the farewell discourse. We've got Gary, who has done his, who is doing his master's thesis on chapter thirteen, and. He will be talking and we will be, uh, you, you know, join us if you would like. Um, the next one is Friday. Friday, what we're doing is that we are going to Gitanjali. I did a series on Gitanjali, partly to celebrate the new year and partly because it is my favorite, absolute favorite uh, book of poems. And it is a very deep take on Indian philosophy. It's the easiest access you have to uh, Indian philosophy that I have seen. Um, so I went, I've, I've re read the entire Gitanjali. You can find it on the 52 Living Ideas um, uh, YouTube channel. Um, but what we're going to do on Friday is I'm going to invite people to read their own favorite poems from Gitanjali. And after they have read it, we will discuss each poems. So um, I invite you to come. And I invite you to come with your top, top poems in the order, actually. So we will get, I'll give everybody a chance to read the poems. If you don't want to read the poems, you can just name the poem and I or somebody else will read it for you if you prefer not reading the poem. And then we will actually discuss it. The first three meetups I did on Gitanjali, I did not want to uh, I wanted to make sure that we went through all 103 poems, which we barely managed to do, which, but we did succeed in going through that because you'd really need to appreciate these works like poetry. You have to let it flow over you and you would be surprised by what you see. If you try to analyze it, go into details, you miss the whole. So you, uh, we have given, you, we have gotten the whole. Now let's each pick the poems that we love and then you talk about it, what you love about it, and then let everybody else talk about it. And then we'll go to the next person. They will read their own favorite poem and we'll go as long as, um, as we can, as many rounds as we can do uh, in, in a couple of hours, okay? So that's, that's Friday. On Sunday, Strupi is going to be back at 1 p.m. Uh, on Monday is um, our Poetic Mondays and Maritza, what do you have? So we're, yeah, we're back from holiday um, on uh, Monday. And so Shrika, I didn't have time to chat about this with you, but you're focused on um, Gitanjali. I thought it might be a nice treat to make um, the featured poet um, Tagore in general, so that people can familiarize themselves with other of his um, work because he has so many. I mean, Gitanjali, absolutely, obviously the biggest one, but he so many of his poems are very deep and moving. I thought it might be a nice way. I had another poem prepared, but then as we were going through Gitanjali, I was like, I think we should make that the featured poet. I, I think that's a great idea. Now, the question is, what is going to be the collaborative poetry about? Because folks, um, the 
the Poetic Mondays, really the heart of it is this collaborative poetry where we get, you want to describe what happens in collaboration? Yes, yes. So what we do is in the first section of um, Poetry Mondays is we read poems together. I'll provide either um, a featured poet or a featured theme, but really you can read whatever you like. Many people now are reading their own poems. They're bringing them for us to share. In the second portion of the evening, we do collaborative poem. Uh, we provide a focusing theme for you to take with you when you go into a breakout room. We don't record the breakout rooms because we want people to feel comfortable. There's always a moderator in all of the breakout rooms, small groups, four to six people. What happens is you're writing a poem. I'll give you a theme. Say if the theme is love, you will go in there and we'll ask you to focus on the theme of love and everybody calls out lines. It's very informal. So for the first um, 10 to 15 minutes, I'm sorry, it's 15 to 20 minutes you spend um, throwing out lines and we don't, we ask for no analysis in that, um, during that time. Whatever lines come to your mind, just call them out. We'll put them down on the, in the shared whiteboard. At the end of that, we have 10 to 15 minutes where we finesse the poem. As a group, you move the lines, you rearrange them, maybe you change a word here or there. And so we did 44 weeks of um, Poetry Mondays in uh, the year calendar year 22. And every time, every time the collaborative poems are really, really great. Even when you think there's no way this is gonna work. It does, and they're so amazing. Um, in the last section, we come back together and read the poems that we've written collaboratively, and it's always amazing. Sometimes we've been experimenting a little, and we've done this thing where when we have two groups, we come back to the main room in the last section, and then we take these poems that were written collaboratively by two separate groups, and we interweave them into this one giant poem, and somehow it still works. So um, it's fascinating and it's, it's, it's almost like magic, how it, it just comes out. And you have all these people who, you know, in the very first um, week that we started uh, Poetry Mondays, they're like, um, I don't know anything about poetry. I went out and bought this one book at this store and I opened a page and that's the poem I'm sharing with you. And, you know, people very much like, no, you know, they're not, um, they're not poets. And I told them, let me tell you something. You're all poets. Every last one of you. And, you know, as time goes by, we're all going to fall in love with each other a little bit mm -hmm. because like you can't help but share little bits of your soul. And the most fascinating thing about the collaborative poetry is that when we give you a focus and theme, your subconscious is working. And as you're throwing out lines, because there's a time constraint and we're asking you not to analyze we get this added richness that we get to discuss in the last section before we part ways for the evening, where we look at the poems and realize the thoughts and the threads, the manner in which that theme came out of each poet and how it's reflected as the collective um, poems. So, and that's just another fascinating thing. We, we sometimes we'll do like, based on what themes we're, we're addressing, in 52 Living Ideas for the Week, we'll choose, uh, Srikanth and I will choose a um, theme that meets, with, that kind of falls along that. And it, it's fascinating. It's like just another way to look at a topic. So uh, Maritza, so for this week, if you're looking at Tagore, we have to look at the core idea of Tagore and make that the topic. Um, so the way in which uh, you can put it in Tagore's language, it's basically the relationship between God and man, or you can put it, you, or you can put it as the relationship between nature and man, or the universal principle and human beings, something like that. So it, people can approach it any of the uh, three ways and they, it will all, I think, work out because it will, you know, I, I would love to see what people do with that theme because in Tagore, that is what we focused on all these I think we spent like almost eight nine hours something like that so far and we're going to spend about two more hours and they will have all of that behind and then say okay now you speak now it's your time you, you've listened to Tagore now you speak let's see what you can do and let's see what we can do together 
if if I were to choose that, I would say that between the spiritual and man, the spiritual. Sure, sure. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So we'll go ahead and uh, do that. Uh, so so that's going to be on Monday. On Tuesday, we are doing Confucius. So Tuesday, we focus on China. So we have, we finished Tao Te Ching. We're going through Confucius now. We're going to take a, we're planning to take a break. I met with Jason. Jason was here in New York. Everybody passes through New York. So I get to meet everybody. Um, so Jason was here and he's planning to do Art of War. He's also planning to do Zhuangzi. And he also wants to do Tao Te Ching again. Um, again, you know, he's, he actually, when he, when he covers it, he does, he and Amon work together to create a translation just for our group. And he goes through character by character and talk about why has he put it this way and what do what are the, all the other translators doing? Each person reads the own the, the translations that they like and they talk from it. And then Jason and Amon talk about their own fresh translation that they do every week. Uh, so that's going to be on Tuesday. On Wednesday, don't miss this. Harold Nelson is going to be back. Okay, I'm just so delighted. And he's going to be talking about the new university that he's starting uh, in order to take his book Design Way and say, how can anybody, regardless of their field, learn desire, design principles and make them a part of themselves? So that's, that's the plan. Um, and, uh, oh, I forgot. Bucky Sunday, 9 p.m. I was so excited about Stroopy's meetup that I didn't remember that I have an amazing, we have an amazing, amazing meetup at 9 o'clock. So Stroopy's meetup is at 1 o'clock this Sunday. At 9 p.m., we have got Daniel Ari Friedman, and he's going to be talking about William Blake and Bucky Fuller, the parallels between their lives. Okay, um, it's going to be, we have spent a lot, we have spent some time looking at um, of uh, at William Blake, thanks to Yasuhiko. So that's that's what it is. So, yeah, exactly. The fourfold symmetry is what uh, Blake, uh, you know, uh, Blake talks about the uh, fourfold vision. So it is, it is really, uh, you know, Yasuhiko did a full presentation of it on it, which is just incredible, which is the last presentation that he did. So, uh, really looking forward to it. Okay, uh, now I want to give a chance for anybody to make any closing comments, just very short comments, less than a minute. Anybody wants to say anything, go ahead and type exclamation mark. Uh, and I would be happy to hear what, what you thought of this entire meetup or anything you want to say. Uh, start with Evanique. Evanique. I want to say thank you, Shurikant, for uh, introducing us to Critical Path. And thank you, Maritza for um, planning it. Um, I'm looking forward to the book. Um, you know, I came to see if I wanted to join you guys on this meetup and I will be. So thank you so much for uh, doing all the work for you and Maritza. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's you know, the uh, biggest thanks are to CJ because he's, he got us started on all of this. Uh, next up is Troopy. Yes, just one last thought that I caught as I I was just outside for a second and there was a star on the sky and maybe one practice we can take with us until we meet again, which has to do with Tetra Scroll. If you look at Tetra Scroll, the, the, the book is Goldilocks and the Three Bears and those three bears are also major, minor, and I don't know the third one. So it's the constellations in the sky and they speak with Goldilocks and they actually tell her that every time we see a constellation of four stars in the sky, whatever we pick, whichever ones we pick, they are always a four eyes, very much indeed. So if you never know where to look for one, go out in the, in the night and look up in the sky and pick any four stars and you can rest assured there's a four eyes. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, Stroopy. Uh, all right, folks, thank you so much, and we'll see you soon. Good night.